The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody. Welcome to Yvonne Book Show on this uh, Monday evening. Hopefully, you are all having a great time and a great week. Had a good weekend and uh, ready for the new week. Ready for the new week. So, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining me. Don't forget, I see 25 people have already liked the show. We haven't even started. I haven't said a word, but they know how good the show is going to be. So, they gave it a thumbs up. Don't forget, before you leave... Whenever you leave to give the show a thumbs up, it uh, helps with the algorithm, it helps with everything else. Anyway, we're going to devote the show today basically um, to talking about riots, looting, the breakdown of civilization, the destruction of the rule of law. We're really getting an illustration in certain parts of America. I mean, this is not widespread yet. Thankfully, it is not everywhere, thankfully, but certainly in places like Portland, Kenosha, I think I got that right, Chicago, certainly a couple of months ago in New York and and in many other places around the country, Seattle, obviously. We've seen what happens. We've seen what happens when society breaks into tribes, breaks into tribes, abandons the rule of law, and where police a marginalized, or police, or restrained, or police basically disappear. Are told, instructed, commanded to give the mob their way, to leave the streets to the mob. We've seen the last few days, just in the last few days, what happens. When people have a sense of chaos, a sense of anarchy, and they want to be heroes, and they take they guns and they go out into the streets to defend property. And you take a 17-year-old and you give him an AR-15. Now, I don't know how many of you, when you were 17, put on an AR-15, held an AR-15, shot an AR-15, went out into the street with an AR-15. I think I was, I was 18. I'm trying to think if I used an AR-15. 15. I think I shot an AR-15 when I was 15, when I was 17. But I don't think I literally got to walk around in the streets uh, with an AR-15 until I was uh, until I was uh, 18 years old. Frank says, no. Stefan says he was four years old, <laughs> fully loaded, <laughs> four years old. <laughs> the rifle was bigger than you were. <laughs> But it's quite a jolt, a power that that rifle gives you. You cannot be stopped when you're holding an AR-15. I mean, you take a 17-year-old, hasn't got a fully developed frontal cortex anyway. We don't allow them to drink. We don't allow them yet into the military We haven't trained them. And you put a loaded AR-15 on them with with all the hormones raging and the cockiness of being 17, the arrogance, the, the, the invincibility of being 17. And it doesn't surprise me and it shouldn't surprise you that a 17 year old like that gets into a situation where, yes, it seems that at the point it was self-defense, but (laughs) he shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have got into a situation where he'd have to use his gun in self-defense. 17-year-olds shouldn't be walking around in the streets of America with AR-15s. And this is a failure, a failure of our entire system. A failure of whatever legal system allows a 17-year-old to open carry an AR-15 in the street. A failure of our police and our political leadership 
that allows the situation to get so out of hand that vigilantes are called for to protect private property that civilians have to go out there not protect their own property protect just property somebody says 17 year old fought in World War II yes they did I was an 18 year old in the, in the military but I got trained I spent months training on a weapon trained and I had a clear clear chain of command nobody just let me out there onto a potential battlefield and said eh, you're all you by yourself as an 18 year old in World War II they had a chain of command they had comrades in arms they had a clear cut enemy they had a clear cut mission and they were trained even in World War II to compare, I've seen this. I, I, I think, I, I don't know if it was Ben Shapiro, somebody I saw saying, oh, what's the big deal? Soldiers, they're 18. They, they have weapons, yeah. And they go through basic training and that's not enough. They still get trained in the specialization, whatever it is that they specialize in. And they constantly train, constantly, constantly train and learn about their weapon and how to use it and when to use it. And if they're going to police in an area where their civilians had to defuse situations in which they, so they don't have to get into a position where they have to shoot civilians. I mean, think about the rules of engagement in Iraq and how difficult it was to shoot at people with guns, never mind at civilians. So this is a massive failure, massive failure of all of our systems to allow this to happen. To allow the very situation to exist. It is not civilized, not acceptable in a civilized country, not acceptable in a free country to allow roaming gangs to riot, loot, and destroy. Now, we'll get to the looting in a little bit. We'll get to the justifications for looting that the left is providing these days. But hell, who cares? I don't care what training. He didn't get he didn't get any formal training. What did he hang out with his friends and some militia and they ran around shooting at targets? That's not training. There's no chain of command when he goes into a, a, a an American city, an urban environment in which people don't have guns around him. He wasn't reporting to somebody, he didn't combat at arms with which he had trained. He was hanging out with a bunch of other vigilantes who showed up out of nowhere. Maybe some of them knew each other. But there was no organization. I mean, it, it's, it's just a sign of the times and the sign of the barbarity of the times and the sign of the craziness of the times that anybody would justify the kid being there in that situation. Even if, even if, at the end of the day, they decided it was self-defense. He should have never been there. Should have never been put in that position. Now, an adult shouldn't have been in that position. Never mind a kid. But a kid with an AR-15, never. He's not even allowed to drink at, at, at 17. Again, not allowed to drink at 17. You're not allowed to vote at 17. Yeah, but... But let's, let's put him with the AR-15 and put him into the streets. Now, I know what an AR-15 looks like. I know how an AR-15 shoots. And it gives you a sense of power that no 17-year-old should be left alone with. But the real failure here is a failure of the police and the failure of the politicians that allow riots and lootings to happen. Why isn't the National Guard called up immediately to shut this thing down? Why are people allowed to destroy property with no consequences? Why are thousands of people arrested and left to rot in jail for a few days, a few months, and if they've been violent, a few years, so as to calm the situation down, calm it through the use of force because that's what the police are there to do to use retaliatory force against people who've already initiated it. We shouldn't be permitting peaceful rallies. If by peaceful, 
You mean rallies in which people bring guns? Or baseball bats? Or clubs? Or anything that can be used as a weapon? That's not a rally. That's not a protest. That's an ask for violence, an invitation for violence, and that should be illegal in a free country. You do not have a right to bring your AR-15 into a demonstration in a free country. You do not have a right to bring a baseball bat to a demonstration in a free country. You do not have a right to threaten other people with the weapons that you carry in a demonstration which is already threatening. I'm not sure demonstrations in the way that we conceive of them today are legal, but certainly once a demonstration becomes looting, once a demonstration becomes a riot, or if there are people within a demonstration that are bearing weapons, that demonstration should no longer be a demonstration, should be shut down. People who don't disperse and don't go home should be arrested and let them rot for a while in jail. And I don't care if the cause is good. That is not the standard. The standard is law and order. There has to be law and order. One doesn't need to use the military for this, and I don't think it should be used. I don't think it needs to be used. I think if the police act quickly, aggressively, decisively, then they can get the situation out to, under control very quickly and relatively easily. And look, I'm not sparing the police here. The police need to be better trained, better capable. And I criticized, I've criticized the police shootings because I think it's pathetic that the police are not trained to handle the situation of one person, two policemen, and they can't handle the situation without having to shoot him. It is absurd and ridiculous. The whole system is crumbling before our eyes. We are seeing all the weaknesses in our systems. We are seeing all the decay, all the rot that exists in our system come to the forefront. Whether it is the fact that the police have no clue what they're doing and lack the training, lack the ability, lack the knowledge, lack the physical strength to do their job. Whether we're seeing politicians afraid to deploy the police, afraid to deploy the National Guard, basically completely surrendering to the mob, which is what you see in Portland, a complete surrender to the mob. Whether you see in Chicago, and I think in Portland and other places, where the police round up the looters, put them in jail, release them the next day and defile no charges, nothing, because they were rioting for a good cause. There is no sense of moral authority, no sense of right and wrong, no sense of acceptable and unacceptable. I mean, Rittenhouse should have never been there. Those riots should have been shut down two nights earlier. Those cops should have been able to subdue Blake without having to shoot him seven times in the back. Once, okay, you're trying to slow him down. Is a knife seven? What are you trying to do? Seven. And they, seven shots and they still didn't kill him. That's, that's pretty amazing. I don't know what he was trying to do with seven shots. We need to get rid of the vigilantes. We need to get rid of the guns on the street. We need to reassert the control of the law in this country. And for that, we need to embolden the police, not make them impotent. And then you've got what Portland, what was it, two nights ago, so Portland, every night there's a riot. It's like just like clockwork. Every night there's a riot. It's Antifa, BLM, just crazies rioting in Portland. What are they writing about? What are they? What are? They, what is their goal? Social justice. They tell us. Somebody will have to explain to me one day how rioting leads to social justice. They want 
the attention of their mommies. Spoiled brats who don't know how to deal with reality. So they go out there into the street to destroy things, knock things down. They can't build, they can't create. They're not producers. What they can do is destroy, and that's what they do. So they're out there smashing things, destroying things, fighting and everything. And Trump supporters show up, I guess, in, in pickup trucks. I don't know if they're, they're proud or whatever. And, you know, a, a combination, I'm sure, of various types of white supremacists and just normal Trump supporters, I guess. They get up, they show up in their, in their, in their pickup trucks with... Uh, what do you call them? Um, what do you call those guns that fire? That fire. Uh, um. Anyway, they're throwing things. They're shooting people not with real guns, but they're shooting people with uh, with these pellets. Um, they're basically paintball. They're shooting the people with paintballs. They're basically engaged in violent activity. And basically, two gangs are there: the Antifa gang and the Proud whatever gang, the white supremacist gang. And they fight. And nobody tries to stop it. There's no police. The police aren't intervening. This has happened before in Portland. No big deal. This is what happens. People fight each other. Gangs, gang warfare is just part of what Portland is. Proud boys in this case, they call themselves. Makes no difference. And, and what's accepted is, yeah, in the evening in Portland, once a week or whatever, people get together and they try to break each other's heads. They try, to, they try to inflict as much pain on each other as possible. And what does the police do? Nothing. Nothing. It just sits aside and let, let it happen. Now, this has been going on in Portland for almost three months. Uh, but it's been going on in Portland for years. Portland has become this hub where once a weekend, different tribes get together and they fight. And the police usually just watch. And they use clubs and they use all kinds of stuff just to beat each other's brains out. And the police do nothing. And they arrest them sometimes and then they free them. They arrest them, they release them. And this time, this time, one of these Antifa thugs, Antifa monsters, nihilist bastards, shot a guy. Now again, this shouldn't shot a guy and killed him. And the Antifa crowd, it looks like we're celebrating. Cool, we shot, we shot at one of, the, one of the Nazis, one of the fascists. After all, Antifa stands for supposedly anti-fascists. They're the biggest fascists in the world. The biggest fascists in the world. But they're the anti-fascists, and if they shoot some white, some guy, then he, he must have been a fascist, because they're anti-fascists. By definition, there can be only two tribes, the fascists and the anti-fascists. They were celebrating the murder. Again, no police. I guess they arrested the guy who actually pulled the trigger. He's some nut who thinks he's saving the world from these fascists in a pickup truck and killing one of them will help, I guess, resurrect the world. Nobody cares. But now the life is gone. Two were killed in, in Kenosha, one in Portland. And, you know, and if we let this, if nobody does anything... If, if nobody asserts moral authority and actual control, then this is going to continue. It, and it'll spread. It's Kenosha tomorrow. It'll be somewhere else the day after that. And it'll keep going. And it's... And again, no moral authority from Trump. No moral authority from Biden. Oh, Biden says, oh, I'm against violence. But again, he equivocates between violence of the left and violence of the right. Right now, it's violence on the left primarily. The right responds and the right gets violent. But the people rioting, the people destroying stuff, the people in the streets are on the left. But no, you know, you can't point that out. Can't point that out. Because the left are the good guys. Now, to some extent, you know, this could be remind people of, of 1968. I mean, people forget the 1968. I mean, this, the American cities were, 
were, there were riots and demonstrations and fires and 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 uh, and, and, and it was huge amount of violence and it was it was really 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 ugly and, and to a large extent to a large extent Richard Nixon won that year as a person promising law and order law and order today the only voice that claims to be for law and order is the voice of, of, a, of, a, of a loser, a thug, a, a, a nothing, like Donald Trump. I mean, who makes Richard Nixon seems like a civilized human being, an irresponsible human being. So uh, we're in deep trouble in this country, deep, deep trouble. Because there are no adults, adult, I mean, irrational long-term thinkers in the room anymore. Just a bunch of kids. Just a bunch of emotionalists. Reason is out the window. Trump's conception of law and order is authoritarianism. My conception of law and order is abide by the law. Protect the law. And in this case... The law is protect property, protect human life, protect the basic foundational rights that all of us have. Not complex. This is the most basic functions. Really, the only legitimate function of government is to protect our individual rights. And what could be more violation of individual rights than our life, body, and our property? Once you stop... Once you start protecting our life and our property, then what do I need government for? I really don't need government. If we're going to have just an anarchy of gangs, then let's just call it what it is. Anarchy and gang warfare. And let's just pick a gang so that we can protect ourselves. But the pretense of still living in a civilized country and yet allowing the gangs to roam around, beating each other up, destroying people's property every single night, and nobody doing anything about it is absurd, ridiculous, nuts. Now, I want to say something about looting. Um, I've got this article here by a um, leftist intellectual, Vicky Ostawa. Vicky Ostawa. I don't know if you guys know who Vicky Ostawell is, but Vicky Ostawell, um, who just published a book, and the book is called, and I'm not kidding you, I know, I mean, I wouldn't believe this if somebody had told me this was the name of the book, but the book is called In Defense of Looting, In Defense of Looting, so we're going to go over her arguments, In Defense of Looting, she thinks looting is a good thing, not a bad thing. We'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. But before that, I want to I wanna remind you to uh, like the show. We've got 82 likes, 156 people wa uh, watching right now. We could get that 82 up to well over 100 in the next few minutes. Uh, I want you to remind you uh, to subscribe and, uh, and to like and everything. Also, I just want to let you know today is Derek's last show in an official capacity as my marketing guru uh, for the show. So you can see him, the Derek Bellamy on the, on the chat with the blue, you know, pushing your subscription. Um, so a number of things about that. First, I want to thank Derek because the, since he's, you know, he only, he's only been with me like three, four months now. And, you know, everything's gone up like this. Now, I don't know if it's all due to Eric, Derek, maybe it is. Maybe he can take credit for all of it, but, you know, everything, uh, a viewership, time watched, subscriptions, everything, and, and money raised, most importantly, is through the roof. Particularly this last month, Derek has made, you know, a good amount of money on his percentage of, uh, of what we brought in from the Super Chat and from everything else. So I wanted to thank Derek. Uh, I think I've learned a lot from Derek, and uh, I'll keep the fact that Derek is gone does not mean I'm not going to be bugging you. 
and I'm not going to uh, com continuously uh, harass you about uh, Super Chat and about sharing and about liking the shows. So uh, Derek has uh, taught me a lot about all of that. But um, today's his last day, and one of the ways in which you can express your thanks to Derek is by doing some big Super Chat contributions today because Derek is still today until midnight. Any money that comes in today until midnight, East Coast time, so it's not a lot of time, uh, he gets a percentage of. So um, so there you go. So if you want to show your appreciation to Derek, you can use Super Chat uh, to, uh, to show your appreciation. And um, you can either ask a question with some dollars. You can just put a post with dollars. I mean, there's a number of features now. There's, there's an applause feature now where you can add for like $2 or $10 or whatever uh, an applause. So you can uh, applaud Derek and, and, and make a, a, a small contribution. So, yes, feel free to, to celebrate Derek and thank him for the work well, job well done that he has done in helping me promote the show and getting us where we are right now. And we are. I mean, this month will be the best month we've ever had in pretty much every dimension. Maybe not in the subscriber dimension, but every other dimension that we have. All right. Enough praising Derek. It'll go to his head, and, and the next client he gets will, uh, you know, will come and, and, uh, and complain to me about it. Uh, but Derek has some cool clients um, that he has signed up recently, so uh, so that's going to be that's going to be really good. All right, let's see. Uh, yes, this uh, article that is just too unbelievable not to talk about. It's just it's just stunning, 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 stunning. All right, so there's a book. A book came out uh, a few weeks ago. In defense of looting, in defense of looting. I'm not kidding you. Um, I'm gonna, so I'm going to read you passages. We can comment on it. Most of it doesn't need commentary because it's so ludicrous. It's so insane. It's so monstrous. Monstrous. That, you know, it's, it's truly, truly hard to believe. But anyway, the first question is, well, what is? What is looting, right? Because, you know, it's hard. So here's how she defines looting, which is interesting. Right? It is the mass expropriation of property, mass shoplifting during a moment of upheaval or riot. She says, that's the thing I'm defending. I'm not defending any situation in which property is stolen by force. <laughs> Let me just read that again to you. She's defending mass expropriation of property, mass shoplifting, but... She's not defending when property is stolen by force. Notice how they empty words from all content. What does expropriation mean? What does shoplifting mean if not stealing property by force? It has no other meaning. That is a particular form of stealing property by force. Expropriating it or shoplifting it. The fact that it is mass does not mean it's not false. She says it's not a home invasion either. It's about a certain kind of action that takes that's taken during protests or riots. So basically she's saying if it's during a riot or a protest, if it's in mass, if a lot of people are doing it, and if it's about destroying or taking, expropriating, God forbid we say stealing, property. That's what she's defending. Note that part of the justification here, without any question, is that it's a numbers game, that there's a lot of people doing it. I mean, and, and basically that's how, that's how we justify, to some extent, that's how we justify democracy, right? So that's how we justify voting. If enough people vote to take your money, if enough people vote to take your stuff, then it's okay. It's not stealing. It's not stealing. It's just taxing. It's not stealing. <sighs> she says, looting is a highly racialized word. 
So to call somebody a looter is somehow racial. It's somehow racist terminology. Now, rioting, she says, I mean, one of the good things about this woman is she defines her terms, so we know what she's talking about. Rioting, she says, generally refers to any moment of mass unrest or upheaval. That sounds about right. Riots are a space in which a mass of people have produced a situation in which the general laws that govern society no longer function, and people can act in different ways in the streets and in public. Writing is, is a broader category in which looting appears as a tactic. So rioting is a situation in which the general laws that govern society no longer function. Well, that's true if the police lets the riot happen. <laughs> if the police arrests the people, puts them in jail, prosecutes them for the crimes they have committed, then there's some semblance that maybe the laws of society are still being upheld. But she's right in the context of today. The honor we've given up on those laws, those rules. By the way, it's interesting how this book came out in the midst of rioting and looting. She must have written it a year or two, three years ago, over the last three years. It takes a long time to write a book like this. So it means that these intellectuals have been talking about the morality, the legitimacy, the efficacy of looting and of writing for years now. The fact that she's written a book means that this has been under discussion for a long time. It's no wonder these people are writing and looting without thinking about consequences. They think that this is just. They think this is right. They've been told by the intellectuals. They've been told by the professors. They've been told by the thinkers that this is okay. That this is right. That this is how you get your way. That this is how you fight for a cause. Ideas have consequences. Ideas shape the world. Ideas drive movements. Ideas drive people. And ideas are not in a vacuum. Ideas don't exist just out there. It's intellectuals that move the world. It's intellectuals. that drive this behavior. It's intellectuals that are responsible for what is going on in the world right now. This is an intellectual, philosophical battle. All right. Keep going. Looting is more common among movements that are coming from below. They attack on a business, a commercial space, maybe a government building, taking those things that would otherwise be commodified and controlled and sharing them for free. It's not stealing. It's sharing. It's forcing people to share. And sharing is good. Sharing is right. Sharing is what we teach Johnny in the sandbox. Sharing is what every adult Adult parent teaches their kids. Sharing is noble and good. This isn't violence. This isn't theft. This is just sharing for free. Now, it's interesting. How many of these people actually share the stuff that they looted for free? How many of these people actually hawk it and take the cash? How many of these people sell it to their neighbors? How many of these people use it? How many people actually share it for free? I guess the people who are sharing it are the owners because they're not going to get it back and the people taking it are not going to be, are not going to be prosecuted. <sighs> Unbelievable. Now, she's being asked about rioting as a tactic. Why do they use this as a tactic? and a strategy. She says it gets people what they need for free immediately. <laughs> when, they 
which means that they are capable of living and reproducing their lives without having to rely on jobs or wages, which during COVID times is widely unreliable, or particularly in those communities, is often not available, or it comes at great risk. That's looting most basic tactical powers of political mode of action. It gets people what they need. Now, if Ayn Rand would have written these lines and Atlas shrugged, and to some extent she did, people would have said, no, nobody would actually say that, that if somebody needs something, it's okay to steal it, as long as they do it in a big enough group. If I went on a speaking tour and said that the left is advocating for stealing stuff in mass in order to give people what they need, and that you can't complain because altruism demands that you give people what they need, people would have said that's insane, that's science fiction. Nobody would actually advocate that. Well, here it is. This is exactly what she is advocating. They need it. And then it's hard. Times of hardship right now. And therefore, it's legitimate for them to take. I mean, who doesn't need a Louis Vuitton bag? Who doesn't need one of those big flat screen televisions? that Best Buy has. That, by the way, are getting cheaper and cheaper every day. They need it. And therefore, that justifies everything. Times are hard because of COVID. And it's not enough that the government is stealing my money and giving it to them, or stealing our kids' and grandkids' money and giving it to them. Giving it to whoever. They need more. They need those Louis Vuitton bags and those flat screen TVs and they need everything else. So they loot it. But here is the real, the real thing they're trying to destroy. She goes on to say, it also attacks the very way in which food and things are distributed. It attacks the idea of property. It attacks the idea that in order for someone to have a roof over their head, or have a meal ticket, they have to work for a boss in order to buy things that people just like them somewhere else in the world had to make under the same conditions. It points to the way in which that's unjust. And the reason that the world is organized the way, obviously, is for the profit of the people who own the stores and the factories. So you get to the heart of that property relation and demonstrate that without police, without oppression, we can have things for free. So really what this is about, in her mind, I don't think in the looter's mind, the looters just want stuff. In her mind, this is really about socialism. This is really about the attempt to destroy capitalism, the annihilation of the capitalist system. This is about the destruction of capitalism and bringing about a socialist order in which, socialist order in which, there are no employees and employers, which is inherently unjust, the Marxist claims. Where everybody gets whatever they need for free. Where the state does not oppress those in need. Police does not exist We have defunded the police so that people just exist taking what they need. This is straight, although it's so amateurist and so dumb and 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 low level that I don't think I don't think Karl Marx would endorse this, but this is so Marxist. But note that the real issue is it attacks the idea of property. And that's exactly right. What's what's beautiful about this is she says it. Looting attacks the idea of property. It rejects the idea of property. But what is amazing to me is, but this is amazing, every time I meet a socialist, I'm amazed at this. I debated, I did a debate with the socialists on Saturday. It'll be up online at some point. And what socialists do is they assume wealth just exists. They assume Louis Vuitton bags just exist. They assume the flat screen TVs just exist. And the food just exists. And that the only political economic question 
It's not how to create the food, how to create the TV, how to create the bag. The only question is, the only question is, Where did it come from? How do you get this stuff? The only question they care about is how do you distribute it? The only question for them is distribution. But note that if you destroy property, if you destroy private property, if you destroy profit, which is, she's accusing profit here, right? If you destroy the profit motive, then what is going to produce? Who is going to produce it? For whom? We know exactly what that kind of system leads to, what that kind of system produces. Nothing. It produces poverty. It produces zero zilch. And yet, she is pro looting because she rejects capitalism and she wants a system in which there's no private property so that people can have nothing and be greatly in need and have nobody to steal it from because nobody will be producing the stuff. Now, of course, property is a white concept. So looting attacks the history of whiteness and of white supremacy. The very basis of property, she writes, in the United States is derived from whiteness and through black oppression, though the history of slavery and settler domination of the country. Looting strikes at the heart of property, of whiteness and of the police. Now, I did a show a while back about how this is all uh, comes from... Um, Rousseau, this idea that these institutions like property, these institutions like civilization, these institutions like the police actually make us worse off, actually make us lose the nobility of the savage. And if we got rid of property, if we got rid of the police, if we got rid of civilization, if we got rid of laws, then crime rates would plummet. Everything would be in abundance. Life would be magical. But we know, in the 21st century, we know without any doubt, without any semblance of doubt, that all that leads to is what is happening in Portland and Kenosha right now, death and destruction. All that leads to is tribal warfare. Indeed, most of human history is a history with no private property. Most of human history is a history with no capitalism, with no individual rights, with no police. There were no police forces in the past. All it was was anarchy. Gangs. My gang versus your gang. My nobleman versus your nobleman. My army versus your army. And whoever was strongest won. The greatness of capitalism is, and this is what we're seeing attempted to be destroyed before our eyes, is that capitalism, about 250 years ago with the establishment of America and with the establishment of civilized rule, laws, governance in Western Europe, Capitalism brought about the rule of law. It brought about civilization. It eliminated force as the dominant factor in human life. It brought about periods of prolonged peace between nations and peace within nations in which people could live freely pursuing their values, their own happiness without being worried about being pillaged and raped and slaughtered and killed and robbed and looted. It civilized human beings who are savages. We were all savages. And capitalism civilized us by providing us with a rule of law. And what these intellectual savages... want to bring about 
is the destruction of that. They want to take us back to the dark ages. They want to take us back to pre-civilization. They want to take us back to tribal warfare. They want to take us back where there's no property, no rule of law, no police. It's truly unbelievable. The one system that actually eradicated slavery, the one system that actually liberated individuals to pursue their happiness, the one system that has brought about peace is the system they want to annihilate, to destroy. And on the path to it, looting, gang warfare, riots, destruction, all as part of their fight against racism, against property, against the police. She says, one of the things that people experience when they loot, listen to this, they experience an imaginative sense of freedom and pleasure that helps them imagine a world that could be. <laughs> a world of thugs, a world of barbarism, a world of dark ages. I mean, unfortunately, I think a lot of libertarians agree with these sentiments. It's experienced, she says, as a sort of joyous and liberatory. <laughs> I couldn't imagine anybody writing this crap. This is who we're dealing with. This is who we're dealing with. She says the whole idea of nonviolence, nonsense. Civil rights actually achieved its biggest successes because of violence. The whole idea of nonviolence is an attempt by white liberals to pacify blacks. The whole idea that, and, and, and this she's being honest, that, oh, no, no, the protesters are not the one the rioters. The rioters are being... Uh, are being instigated by outsiders. She says that's ridiculous. That's a way that's a way to diminish black protesters by giving the real power to the white instigators. No, she says, no, it's the protesters rioting. I don't know if she's white or not. I haven't looked up her color skin. I don't really care about her color of her skin. It's the quality of her character and her ideas that I care about. And oh my God, she says, even this idea of attacking your own community. So what if they attack their own community? They're attacking store owners in their own community. Owners of stores who are paying them wages, which is immoral and unjust. Property owners. Stores in which they might have been followed around by security guards or by their owner himself. So just because they live in the same Neighborhood doesn't make them any less racist, capitalist. She says, when it comes to small business, family-owned business or locally-owned business, they are no more likely to provide worker protections. They are no more likely to have to provide good stuff for the community than big business. She says, it's actually a Republican myth that has, over the last 20 years, really crawled, uh, uh, crawled into even leftist discourse that the small business owner must be respected, that the small business owner creates job and is part of the community. But that's actually a right-wing myth. <laughs> it's a myth. She doesn't discriminate between small businesses and big business. Good for her, neither do I. <laughs> she hates them both equally. They all represent capitalism. They all represent property rights. They all represent oppression. This is what we're up against. This is what we're up against. It's called a book. The title of the book is In Defense of Looting. And it's in defense of mayhem, anarchy, return to barbarism, return to tribalism, return to violence. And this is what's coming out of our universities. 
This is what you support if you support your alma mater. This is what you support when you send your kid to school. This is what you're, what you're supporting implicitly when you go to university. It's in defense of destruction, in defense of suicide, of Western civilization, or all civilization, Western or otherwise. It's basically a condemnation of capitalism in the name of communism. In the name of egalitarianism. In the name of the worst, the worst possible to mankind. And the only way to combat this, the only way to combat this, is with ideas. The only way to combat this is to go after these people, to, 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 to unmask them. And it's not hard because they write this crap. And you know where this interview that I read to you was from? NPR. NPR interviewed this woman, this monster, casually, professionally, as if this is just another book. This is a book calling for looting, calling for rioting, calling for destruction, calling for violence. And yet, it's treated like, well, yeah, what's the big deal? My book, I don't know if my book will sell sold more or less than her book, but my book will never get an interview on NPR. What do I call for? Capitalism. Freedom. Protecting individual rights. Allowing people, leaving people alone to pursue their happiness. But if you write a book... See, I should, have, I should have written a book about how capitalism is the real anti-racism. Yeah, no, they wouldn't have bought it. They wouldn't have bought it. I mean, really, it's getting so absurd, so insane on the left, so nutty, so ridiculous, that Nobody is ultimately, at the end of the day, going to support them. So Joan says, and I don't know if this is true, she says, Vicky Osterwell is a white trans woman. Um, doesn't surprise me she's white. And I don't really care one way or the other about her being trans. But doesn't surprise me she's white, just like the woman who wrote White Fragility is white. And they're insane. I mean, they are white by guilt for being white, for owning property, for living in a capitalist country, for actually having some wealth. Now, a trans woman is a trans woman. I, I, I'm, I'm, I have no problem calling a trans woman a trans woman. There's no point in calling a trans woman a man. You gain nothing by it. She is a, it's, it's a man who, you know, lives as a woman. So short for that is a trans woman. Right? Um, and many of them have done chemical things to their bodies and maybe even surgical things to their bodies to remove whatever evidence there is that they are a man. So trans is fine in that sense. Um, anyway, th this is where we are. Now, uh, I've said in the past that the reaction to this is, uh, it has to be, must be, will be, causally, the reaction that was to Weimar Germany. The reaction that there is to any anarchy. And that is real law and order. The reaction to, in defense of looting, is to shoot the woman, to destroy the people, to, to, to come down on them in authoritarian ways. That's what this is leading to. That's the real disaster. In a sense, these people are harmless if there was a real opposition to them. If the opposition was a freedom-based opposition, then they're harmless. If the police actually did their job, then these people are harmless. What makes them dangerous is that the police are not doing their job, which makes the escalation of violence even greater, which makes them more powerful, which then riles up the population, makes the population eager makes the population ready for a tyrant, 
ready for the authoritarian who will shut these people down for once and for all. And that is the real danger. And that's why I always have said, the left will never govern. There is no governing ideology here. There is no governing strategy here. There is no governing program here. Egalitarianism will never fly in America. Will never fly in a civilized country. The response to it will be authoritarian all the way through. The rise of authoritarianism in this country is the real danger. It's not Marxism. It's the response to Marxism. It's not anarchism. Anarchism cannot win. It's the response to the anarchism. The kind of so-called law and order that will be brought about in order to silence them. That is the real danger. Uh, all right, let me just see if there are related questions here quickly. Um, Tribalism in major coastal cities seems to be splitting country into two. Do you see the logical outcome of this conflict in U.S. splitting along coastal cities in both coasts or Midwest? No, I, at the end of the day, I don't think that you'll see the country split. I don't think you'll see a literal civil war. I think what you'll see is a strong man who will unite the country under a strategy of law, order, and global, and, and protecting us from climate change or something like that. That's what I see. I see an authoritarian, and I used to think it's 50 years out. Now I think it's 10 to 20 years out. I see it coming. I see it accelerating. I, you know, we're going to go through a very difficult economic period in the next 10, 20 years. Uh, we're going to go through continuation of this tribalism, continuation of these riots and lootings and so on. And, and I think the only possible response to that, I think, in America, because I don't see America having a civil war, I mean, there'll be skirmishes, like there was just now in Portland, but there won't be a full-blown civil war. It'll be a dictator who comes about. Maybe, maybe sooner, maybe next election, maybe 2024, maybe 2028, maybe 2032. I don't know what the timing is going to be, but it's coming. It's coming. The country's ready for it. A majority of the country just wants this to be over with. Just stop this. Just, just get it over with. Just stupidity. Stop it. Right? We don't want anarchy. We don't want looting. We don't want people writing books in defense of looting. So if we have to violate the free speech, so be it, right? That's the, that's the attitude, I think, that's out there. And I don't think it'll be Trump. I think it'll be somebody more capable, more charismatic, but more capable than Trump is. All right, uh, let's see. Um, are the Trump supporters going to Portland exemplifying altruism? One interest that they have in defending another city. No, it's not about altruism. And they're not defending anything. They're not that they defend anything. They're there to fight. They're just, the, the Trump supporters going to Portland are there to stick it to the left. They're not there to defend property because they, they weren't. They were driving through and shooting at people, right? I mean, shooting uh, um, uh, paintball guns and, and other things. It, it, it had nothing to do with that. It's, it's people wanting a thrill. It's people wanting to so-called stand up to the left. It's people wanting a fight. It's not, it's not people advocating for, 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 for the police. It's, it's people who want to get it over, to get the left and the right. They want, in a sense, a civil war. They, they want to stand up to the left. It's not about defending. It's not about altruism. What are they interested in? They have? they have no real interest. Their interest is in creating mayhem. Their interest is in fighting. Their interest is in getting attention. Their interest is in psychological. It's tribal. Their interest is defending their tribe. That's the fundamental. It's to defend their tribe. I'm not going to answer Super Chat questions for Friday. I'm going to try again. If not, they'll spill over to next time. I will answer all of them at some point, I promise. Um, how could the Nazis have been a reaction to the nihilist left? when Nazi intellectuals themselves were nihilists. Well, but they switched, right? The Nazi intellectuals started out as nihilists and then switched. Nazism is not about, at least doesn't project itself as nihilistic. Nazism projects itself as this only solution to nihilism. It projects itself as 
the way to deal with nihilism, the way to channel, if you will, nihilism into a system, into a particular goal, into a particular motivation. So this is what happens to leftist nihilists. They become authoritarian thugs. So what happened to the intellectuals of the 30s in Germany who were leftist nihilists is they became Nazis. But by becoming Nazis, in a sense, they converted their nihilism into this more concentrated evil, into this more organized structure. Now, in the end, the goal is the same. I agree with that. In the end, the goal is destruction. In the end, is the goal is death. In the end, is everything up in flames. But there are different ways to present that goal, different ways in which that goal manifests, if you will. All right. Uh, and, and notice, so anyway, I, I would read the, 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 uh, both the ominous parallels and dim hypothesis to see, I think, what I mean by that. Um, how do you think this behavior compares to how, for example, tribes in places like British Isles acted in dark ages? I think it's the same. I think what is, they're really driving at here is to return to the Dark Ages. There's a certain mythology about the Dark Ages of a, you know, this is, if you, on the right, if you think about what is the Bronze, Bronze Age pervert that I talked to Brad Thompson about and I did a show about. Bronze Age pervert is a nostalgia for the Bronze Age. It's a nostalgia for the Dark Ages. It's a nostalgia for when men were men. Muscle was muscle. And you fought for your food. And you killed for your food. And you, it was all about power and strength. It was the opposite of capitalism. It was the destruction and the negation of the human mind in the name of muscle. That's what they want. And, and, and it's one thing to be a fan of the middle of the dark ages. I don't know when you're in, when you're in the 1700s, but it's another thing to be a fan of the Dark Ages when you're in the midst of the greatest wealth creation machine in human history, when you're in the midst of the greatest prosperity in human history, when you're in the midst of the most freedom in human history. Uh, let's see. Socialism isn't going to win, but how do we keep them from losing at the hands of the fascists? Um, we have to fight the socialists and the fascists. We can't just fight the socialists. This is why we cannot ally with the people who represent fascism, even though they're not full-blown fascists yet, in order to fight, fight the socialists and the communists. We don't want to fight one form of authoritarianism by aligning ourselves with another form of authoritarianism. We need to form an alliance of those people who still believe in individualism and freedom still believe in reason. And we then need to fight both the fascists and the socialists. The fascists and the socialists. The left today and the right. We need a coalition of individualists. A coalition of reason. A coalition that believes in property rights. Even if they don't believe in property rights the way we do. But at least not in the, the way the looters do or the way the right does which is a nationalistic, not, not property rights don't matter. It, it, what matters is the nation. What we need to do is form a coalition of individualists, pro-reason, pro-property rights, to fight both right and left. There's no other option. Do you think the intellectuals like the article's author are conscious of the fact that they stand for physical annihilation? No. But I, I think they know it to some extent. The, 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 the evasion is massive. But these people are truly evil. These are not good people who are mistaken. You cannot be mistaken to write an, a, a, a book like that. That is a pure evil book that involves massive amounts of evasion. To think that you can... I mean, the same thing happened to me with the socialist I was debating the other day. He said, no, 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 no. We don't believe in taking your personal stuff, just your means of production. 
Well, what's the difference? Is my money personal or a means of production? So I, I, I think it's massive evasion. Can you come? No. Um, okay, I'll take this $20 question and then I want to talk about Bezos and then we'll go back to Super Chat and I'll, I'll take Super Chat questions that are $20 or more today. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go to Friday's question and start doing them. Um, you say you won't vote for Biden. At what point does one's best interest of voting for the lesser of two evils get overridden by not wanting to sanction even the lesser and not voting altogether? You know, I don't know. It's a hard question. I, I think that um, I think I can imagine a situation where I would vote for Biden um, if I thought it mattered, if I thought it would help Trump losing a landslide, then maybe I would vote for Biden because I think the only hope this country has right now is for Trump to lose in a landslide. Um, I think, but since I my vote doesn't matter anyway and I can't vote anyway, uh, look, I, I don't want to tell you how to vote. You have to decide how to vote. To me right now, the most important thing is politically is to have Trump lose in a landslide because I think that that the only hope this country has is for a Republican Party in the short run is for a Republican Party to be reborn. For a Republican Party to be reborn on better, not great, but better principles. The only hope this country has in the short run is for Nikki Haley, Ben Sass, Lee, uh, from, and some others who represent the better elements of the Republican Party to have a chance. As long as Trump is president, those people don't have any chance. Any chance. Any chance. If Trump is president for another four years, then the Republican Party is finished. Finished. Completely. Utterly. It's gone. Nikki Haley doesn't belong there. Ben Sass doesn't belong there. All of these other people don't belong there and they won't last in that political party. It's a political party now of statist rightism. It is a political party that becomes a political party that is nationalist and verging on fascist. Not quite a fascist, but verging on, on the way there. You have to save something. Politically, we live in a political world. You have to have somebody advocating for slightly better stuff. Because otherwise, if either the left or the right today get everything they want, then we lose freedom on a massive scale. The only thing that stops it is the slowness of the political process in the United States, the gridlock that be created by having a political party. I want a political party that opposes the left's takeover of the means of production. And I don't think Trump will do that. I think Trump will take over the means of production. So it's just a question of, do you just, if you just want statism, if, you've, if you just accept it, it's just going to happen, then it's just a question of who's going who's gonna to do it first, the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm still hoping we can avoid state, complete out-and-out -out statism, authoritarianism. But to do that, you have to have a political party that stands for something that is not statist. And the only way to do that is to, to have a political party that stands in opposition to the statists and the only political party that can do that right now is the republican party but to do that it has to reform itself it has to get rid of every remnant of trump that it has and there'll be there's going to be a fight if trump loses there's going to be a massive fight within the republican party between the trump elements and the non-trump elements and i think that is the fight to a large extent of, of america's future Democrats will not, Democrats at the federal level will not destroy this country because they will not win, not long term. You know, if, if, if Biden wins the election, the riots will actually stop. If Biden wins the election, he's not going to be able to do very much, particularly if, if certainly if Republicans keep the Senate, he'll be able to do very little. Uh, you know, maybe he'll give us a public option to Obamacare. We almost got that under Obama. Maybe he'll spend some money on windmills and, and, uh, and solar panels. Who cares? I mean, given how much government is spending, look, look how much Trump has just spent $3.7 trillion. 
of stimulus. $3.7 trillion. There's no way Biden is going to spend $3.7 trillion on anything. What is the worst that's going to happen? No, actually, when Biden wins, the police will get tough. I mean, they can't say that, but that's exactly what's going to happen. It's exactly what's going to happen. And Biden will govern generally from the center because he knows that's the only way he can sustain his political power. Um, And... The world will not end if Biden wins. I know, I know, I know, I know. People think it will. I know. But it won't. And I, it, it, the same thing happened with, with Obama and the same thing happened with the second term of Obama. And the world didn't end. Obama's a terrible president, but the world didn't end. And he didn't destroy America. You know. But another term of Trump will destroy America, in my view. And will destroy the only chance that we have to resurrect America, which is a Republican Party that is semi-sane. That will be gone forever. That will be gone forever. Mike Pence is an is a, is a evangelical conservative who is a mealy mouth nothing. And, he, you know, Mike Pence is no force within the Republican Party. Has no power in the Republican Party. Has no force within the Republican Party. The only thing that keeps him going is his loyalty to Trump. You know, Democrats have always been, I mean, the the fringe on the left has always been uh, detached from reality. The fringe on the left has always been. You think you think AOC invented anything? I mean, AOC reflects much of, is she is she that much worse than McGovern was in 1972? Are any of them that much worse than the than the leftists were in the 1960s? They, they are in a sense, they're, they're more nihilistic and they're more uh, egalitarian. But just like the, the left in the 1960s didn't really gain political power ever. The left AOCs of the world will not gain political power in America. They will not be the winners. And it doesn't matter who wins this election. They will not be the people who dominate. And Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris is not a, a, a leftist fringe figure. She is a power luster. And to maintain power, she will have to govern from the center. Now, the center is pretty left today. But she will have to govern away from the fringe left. Because if she governs even for a day from the fringe left, then the Democrats are finished. The Democrats are finished. Again, read Dim. I completely agree with Dim. Dim clearly demarcates the real risk comes from the right. Now, they, that risk manifests itself through the left, but it comes from the right. All right, um... All right, looks like you guys are going to force me to push uh, Bezos till another show with all these questions. A lot of super chat questions, a lot of $20 questions. Yeah, don't bother asking questions less than $20 because we're not going to get to them today if you do that. All right, um, election year question. Uh, oh, I did that already. That's right. Okay, uh, do you think a Cold War with China would be beneficial for the U.S.? It would shift our focus on outside threat. In addition, many of American innovation, science, technology happened during the last Cold War. No, I think it would be a disaster. I think a Cold War with China would be a disaster. I think, as I've said many times, and I know people people cringe when I say that, but but the, our trade with China and our relatively friendly relationship with China over the last 40 years has been a huge boon to the American economy. Is it allowed the American economy to grow at the rates of growth that it has, which have been pretty meager, but it would have been a lot less than that. Our standard of living is significantly higher, significantly higher because of, um, uh, uh, of our trade relationship with China. I think a Cold War with China would be a disaster for us and a disaster for China. I think it's a bad thing. It's, there's nothing good about it. Um, it might be necessary because China is going so all out authoritarian, so, um, so badly authoritarian. So, you know, becoming so bad that it might be necessary to have a Cold War with China. But it's not good for economy. And the Cold War with the Soviet Union was not good for economy. It was necessary because the Soviet Union was a real threat to the United States. But it wasn't good for economy. American innovation didn't happen because of the Cold War. Indeed, 
the greatest peak of American innovation happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century, through, the, through before World War II. That's the peak of innovation. And there was no Cold War then. Innovation slowed dramatically during the Cold War, and it's slowed dramatically now. Not because of a Cold War, a lack of Cold War, but because of government intervention, because of government control. So, no, Cold War's war generally is never good economically. War generally is not good for anybody. Cold or hot, wars are bad. Now, they're necessary sometimes. But if you can avoid them, it's better to avoid them. But don't pretend that they have economic benefits. They do not. War is a negative sum game. Trade is a plus some game. Trade is win-win. War is lose-lose. Some people lose more. The loser loses more. But the winner loses. Loses lives and loses energy. And the same with the Cold War. Cold War, people lose productive energy. Goes to the Cold War instead of to, to production, creation, building, innovation. So no. Since the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, with riots continuing globally, what about law and order between the battle of China versus India, Greece versus Turkey? How is the global economy evolving? I mean, we're seeing a breakdown in the global, in the global system, in the global economy, in the global status quo. A lot of that is the fact that America is weak and nobody pays attention to us anymore. A, a lot of this is a consequence of uh, Trump's foreign policy, which be, has been an unmitigated disaster, his sucking up to places like Turkey, which gives it the 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 backbone to not just go after uh, Syria and 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 to take over Syrian land and to go over to the Kurds, who are Americans' allies, but now to go after Greece as well. It's it's Trump's weakness that uh, that allows China to go after India, and there's a real scenario in which. China might take advantage of, um, of uh, uncertainty about the election results. Imagine if uh, we're in, in uh, December or January and we don't have clear-cut election results and the United States is in kind of shock and in mayhem. If China uses that opportunity, imagine if China uses that opportunity to go after Taiwan. What does the United States do then? So it's American weakness that is bringing about this, uh, you know, this mayhem around the world and the and the uh, you know the, the the lack of any kind of leadership, the lack of moral compass, the lack of a shiny city on a hill, the lack of an alternative model to the Chinese model. Everybody wants to be the Chinese, which means authoritarianism, which means what they call state capitalism. I put that in quotes. Quote state capitalism. China has become the model that we should emulate. But uh, that's what's resulting. And, uh, you know, what about law and order between the ballot? You know, law and order, it's not our job to provide law and order, but law and order is provided when America is strong, when America is clear, when America is, is a model, when America is a shining city in the hill, then people stop. People stop. By the way, for those of you who think that there will be no riots if Trump gets reelected, then why are there riots now? Trump hasn't done anything because Trump is weak. They sent in federal troops to Oregon. Uh, things got worse, not better. Then they, uh, federal troops left Oregon. Things continue to be bad. Trump has done nothing. Kennesaw, they sent in the National Guard. Things got a little better when they sent in the National Guard, but they don't need... Trump to send in the National Guard. But if, uh, my view is, if Biden were president, Oregon would actually ask for the help of the federal government, so would these other states, and they'd actually clamp down on these, uh, these riots and they'd shut them down. But nobody wants Trump's help because he's Trump. Because he's Trump. So no, I, I actually think the riots would go away. I think there'd be other problems, and the problems would be the, the kind of leftist policies that a Biden would institute, which are bad. 
And it's horrible, it's horrible that the left in any form would win anything because of intellectuals like this woman who, who is of the left. So who wants people like that to win? But we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. The fact is we're screwed. We're screwed no matter who wins. We're screwed no matter what happens. Biden has no incentive to create mayhem if he's president. Biden has every incentive to have peace if he's president. I mean, this, this conspiracy theory notion that, that, uh, that Biden would want riots when he is president is, is, is absurd. It shows a misunderstanding of the American political system. If, if that happens under Biden, if that happens under, under his administration, if they allow that to happen under his administration, the Democrats will be wiped out, wiped out in a 2022 election, completely wiped out. They'll lose the Senate and then they'll lose the House. And they don't have that incentive. So, no, they, I mean, Hillary doesn't have that incentive. Hillary's not pulling the strings. Biden hates Hillary's guts. Biden hates Hillary. Hillary's not pulling the strings in the Democratic Party. If she was pulling the strings in the Democratic Party, she would have never lost to Obama. If she was pulling the strings to the Democratic Party, she would have run this time and won. She's not pulling the strings. All right, we are in the midst of dealing with a, the blowback of the Obama presidency. Eight years of a leadership vacuum. Not that Trump is much better. The backroom deals made against the interests of the American people. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think Trump is blowback against Obama. Trump is blowback against the, 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 the disrespect Obama showed to the American people, the disrespect Obama showed to the American past, the disrespect Obama, Obama showed to the American heartland, to the American people, to the American, call it average Joe, to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to the common American. The, the, the disrespect that the left generally is shown to them, not just Obama, but Hillary and so on. That's what we experienced. Trump was a blowback against all of that. But Trump has not done anything positive. Has not done anything positive to move the country in a positive direction or to unite the country around any kind of vision of what the country should stand for. Trump has basically taken Obama's divisive policies, taken Obama's disrespect, taken Obama's snobbery, and exacerbated it and put it on steroids and made it worse and increased the, the energy around it. So if Obama created this split, he didn't create it because it's existed for a long time, between the heartland of America and the coasts, Trump has said, yeah. Let's go for it. That split is real. Let's deepen that split. Let's make the split even more real. Let's make that split much more visceral. A, a daily thing, daily Twitter, daily messaging around this split. Let's make it clear that we have two tribes in America, them and us. And you can choose. You can be with them or you can be with us. That's it. And he's done this brilliantly. And, and his whole way of governing, and I've said this from the beginning, is us versus them. Us versus immigrants. Us versus illegal immigrants. Us versus legal immigrants now. They're taking American jobs. Us versus China. Us versus Mexico. Us versus Canada. Us versus the European Union. The whole idea of tariffs is an us versus them. All of it, all of it is an institutionalization of tribalism, an institutionalization of us versus them, an institutionalization of the fact that everything is conflict. Everything is a, you know, a struggle between the, you know, these two forces in the universe. And you have to pick sides. And there's real importance to, for president to try at least, to make an effort at least, to bring a country together, 
to bring a country around common goals and common interests and common motivations and common principles and ideally around the Constitution, but whatever, you know, bring it together. And, and, and Obama and but Trump even more so have focused their energy and attention on splitting the country apart. You know, rule, you know, divide and rule. Divide and rule. I'm not sure we're better off under Trump. You, you think we are? I am, I'm not sure we are. I'm not sure at all that we are. I think we're worse off under Trump. And I think our future is worse off under Trump. That is, we have put ourselves into a path that, because of Trump, that is going to be almost impossible to come back from. And that path is towards fascist, towards authoritarian dictatorship in this country. All right. Um, yeah, and you, and you can see it, right? So, yes, I think, I think we're living through blowback to a large extent. All right. I am going to move the... I mean, yeah, let's talk about Bezos quickly. So, uh, I, I don't know if you saw this, but more of these leftist thugs, these nihilist, these creepy... Rousseau, I mean, here's the real link to Rousseau. Uh, uh, I think it was last week, late last week, over the weekend... They went out in front of Jeff Bezos' house. I think he has a house in Washington, D.C. And in front of Jeff Bezos' house, they literally built a guillotine. Now, what is the meaning of building a guillotine? When were guillotines used against the so-called elites? Well, the guillotines were used in the French Revolution. A revolution inspired, to a large extent, by Rousseau inspired by Rousseau's ideas about egalitarianism and about the destruction of civilizing institutions. Now, you can somewhat justify the revolution in the sense that it was against a horrific monarchy. But it very quickly devolved from a revolution against the monarchy to a revolution of blood destruction in the name of of egalitarianism, a form, a kind of communism. And of course, the guillotine was their means of execution. The guillotine was what they used to eliminate the aristocrats. They eliminate those with privilege, real privilege. Aristocrats have real privilege. That's why never use the word privilege when referring to America. There's no privilege in America, except maybe to the political class and the cronies. And that has nothing to do with skin color. The only privilege in America is the political class and its cronies. The guillotine represents the slaughter of those with privilege. The guillotine represents the slaughter of those in power. The guillotine represents the slaughter of those who have more. But not those who created more. Those who have more. The left can't see the difference between aristocrats under King Louis XIV, or was it the 17th, Louis XVII, and a producer, a genius, like Jeff Bezos. Now note that the culture we live in, many people on the right were happy about the guillotine, because many other people on the right hate Jeff Bezos, want to break up Amazon, hate Amazon. I mean, Trump, how many times has Trump attacked Bezos? So now we have a left and a right who hate the producers, who hate the builders, who hate the great innovators of our lives. There should be a lot more likes. I mean, I, mean, I got five dislikes. I'm not sure exactly why. I guess because I attacked the left and some leftists showed up maybe. Or maybe I attacked Trump and some Trump supporters showed up. But there should be a lot more likes. So please, before you leave, don't forget to like the show. Let's get it up to over 200 now. It could be easily over 200 right now. So the people putting this guillotine out there are not just common Marxists or common socialists. These are bloodthirsty, egalitarian nihilists. These are people who can't differentiate between builders and takers, between the aristocrats of the 18th century and the capitalists 
well, they're not even capitalists, but, but the, the producers, the entrepreneurs, the builders of the 21st. If anybody deserves his wealth, it is Bezos. Now, note that, that yes, Jeff Bezos has made a lot of money during the pandemic, but why has he made a lot of money during the pandemic? His wealth has increased, but why has his wealth increased? How did his wealth increase? It increased because he saved our lives. It increased because Amazon is what made life tolerable during this pandemic, during lockdowns, during being shut down. It is because of his genius in setting up Amazon that we all could survive, that we all could get food and other basic necessities that we needed without going out, without risking our lives, well, not our lives, you know, our health, and the health of those people who serves us at the stores. Here, we didn't have to go out. The increase in the value of Amazon, which, by the way, is paper wealth, because if Bezos tried to sell all that stock in Amazon, there's no way he could get the common price on it. The price would plummet if he sold it. But it's paper wealth. The increase of the value of Amazon is because we discovered how indeedly valuable it is. How beneficial to human life it is. How beneficial to human life it is, even during really, really bad times for human life. If anybody deserves to have made a lot increase in wealth, made a lot of money during this crisis, it is Jeff Bezos. Because he had the foresight, the imagination, the organization, the capacity, the ability to build Amazon, to set it up. And when a pandemic hit, we all went, whoa, all right. Yeah. So I think Jeff Bezos is one of the great heroes of the world. I think a guillotine outside of Jeff Bezos' house is a great, one of the great moral travesties. It is disgusting. It is offensive. But it says everything you need to know about the world in which we live in today, where nobody, left or right, appreciates the builders and creators. Nobody, left or right, appreciates markets and how they work. Nobody, left or right, appreciates the entrepreneurs. We need to laugh, we leave the collectivists of the left and the collectivists of the right to rot and build something new, build something different. And yes, the right would have never built a guillotine. This is a purely a creation of the nihilist left. And how emboldened it feels in the world in which we live. How emboldened it feels in a world which Obama and now Trump have created. We have got to find an alternative. We have got to find another path, another route, another way out of this. If the choice is between the nihilists in the streets and Trump, then we are lost. We are finished. It's the end. The only hope, the only hope, and maybe this is a pipe dream. Maybe Stephanie on the chat is right. Maybe I'm dreaming. But the only hope is that Biden buys us time. Time for the Republican Party to get its act together. That's the only hope. Because another four years of Trump is another four years of what's going on right now, another four years of incompetence, another four years of destruction, and another four years of collectivism of the right getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And by the way, the more the collectivism of the right gets stronger, the more nutty the left will become. The more radical, the more extreme the left will become. The more further out the left will become. If Biden loses, the conclusion will be we need somebody like Bonio AOC. And then it'll be, and, and then we, it's a shortcut. It's a speed race 
to who will take over this country completely. All right. I mean, I've seen Rousseau everywhere. It's really interesting. It's just, it's, that's new for me. One article I read linking Rousseau to, to, to these riots, and now I'm seeing Rousseau everywhere. And there he is with the guillotine in front of Jeff Bezos' house. Despicable. Just despicable. All right, let's run through a few of the Super Chat questions because I know I'm way behind. In regard to Tukril's democracy in America, would you consider his observation of American sense of self-interest well understood as a sort of proto-objectivism? Uh, thanks a bunch. Well, not proto-objectivist, but certainly a proto-egoist. There's no question that America, at the founding and post-founding, had a certain morality of self-interest. Primitive, I- I- implicit, not explicit, un, you know, not, not, not uh, uh, written out in detail, not explained well, not philosophical. But there was definitely, definitely a sense of personal responsibility, a sense of the pursuit of happiness, a sense of don't tread on me, don't tell me what to do, I have to live my life by my standards, my way. In that sense, yes, there was very much a a sense of self-interest and and egoism, Um, but not objectivism. Objectivism is a philosophy, and there was no philosophy. There was no philosophical foundation. That's why, to a large extent, it died. I see that my request for thumbs up has generated a bunch of thumb down. My, that's all because of Trump, I know, because that's all post my comments on Trump. So a bunch of thumbs down. So uh, those of you who maybe think I deserve a thumb up, then go over there and give it a thumbs up to counter all the thumbs down that, I've, that have been generated. And let's get... Uh, and the only 9 thumbs down and 202 thumbs up for those of you. Uh, who are listening to this and not watching. Um, Frank, thank you. Keeping collaborative language alive. Much appreciated. Yes. Uh, As Trump's contradictions ignored by his followers, like they ignore the contradictions in Christianity. It's like Trump is their God who is going to fix everything and follow him no matter what. Yeah. I mean, certain followers, certainly. There's a, there's a religion of Trump. And, and this is what I've meant really since 2016 uh, Ankar Gatte wrote about this. Other objectivists have written about this. Uh, and I've talked about this. In many of the Trump supporters, not everybody, but in many of the Trump supporters, those who will excuse anything he does, those that would have voted for him even if he shot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue, that attitude is definitely an attitude of religion. That attitude is definitely an attitude of faith. That attitude is definitely an attitude of of worshipping an authoritarian, worshipping somebody who could do no wrong, worshipping somebody who has full control. So uh, Trump, no question, has honed in to whatever authoritarian um, likings there are within the American people, within the American public, and has triggered those, and has fed those. And in the people who never see anything he does being wrong, never justify everything he does. We see the birth of authoritarianism in this country. And you saw, the, you saw someone on the left with Obama. He could do no wrong. He was like God, Jesus walking on water. And again, that religiosity, you saw a little bit of that with George Bush right after 9-11, but it dissipated quickly. But with Obama and with Trump, you've seen it full-fledged, and more with Trump than with Obama. More with Trump than with Obama. And it is. It's exactly like religion. And, and you always wondered, how do countries become authoritarian? How do countries embrace authoritarianism? How do the people succumb to it? And I think we're living through it right now. We're living through it right now. Partially, it's to say the other side is so evil. The other side is so bad. The other side will be so destructive to everything we believe in then we have no choice but to go this authoritarian route. That is definitely part of the story that is told. And it's an important part of the story being told right now. Uh, Alexander writes, uh, thank you for a detailed answer to my question, Iran. Greatly appreciate it. But if you agree, this is the blowback to the Obama presidency. Did this not begin with the left and their decades of trampling on the Constitution? 
<sighs> Look, it began with the progressives, who, who are the left, in the 19th century. So it began over 100 years ago. And it grew because of the inability of those who believed in the Constitution and individual rights to defend it. They were reliance primarily on religion to defend it. So it grew out of the dominance of the left in the intellectual world, starting over 100 years ago. And the weakness, the weakness of the right for the last 100 years. And it feeds off of each other constantly. The left, so look, if you're asking me what the source of this is, of course the source of it is the left. The source of it is German philosophy. The source of it is, is Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx. The source of it is German romantic philosophy that was brought to America by German immigrants and, and other European immigrants in the mid-19th century and that became the progressive movement that led to domination of our universities as early as the 19-teens and the 1920s. And as over time, chipped away at the Constitution, chipped away at our system of government, chipped away at our values, chipped away at capitalism, embraced the mixed economy, embraced forms of authoritarianism, and, and, and continued to grow. And the right, instead of standing up for the Constitution, standing up for individual rights, standing up for right, values, defaulted, caved, gave up, embraced the mixed economy, presented religion as a defense of the American system of government, and, and was pathetic. That's why we're here. Obama is just a manifestation of a 100-year-old trend. So the fact that the left started it I mean, so what? What difference does it make? The left won't end it, in my view. The right will end it. That is, the right will be the source of the authoritarianism. Religion, nationalism will be the source of the authoritarianism. America will never be a communist country. Will never be a truly egalitarian country. America can be, though, a fascist country. America can be an authoritarian country of the right. So that's my view. It's, it's not who started it that's important. It's who should one support today. And in my view, the people we're supporting today are the better elements in the Republican Party. The people we're supporting today are the people out there, the intellectuals primarily, who advocate for reason in some sense or another. This is why I support the intellectual dark web, because at least they have a respect for reason. So anybody who has a respect for reason and individualism should be supported. And everybody who doesn't should not be. And that's, that's my view. The only hope is that we somehow convince the American people to return to the principles this country was founded on. Don't know how. Don't know how, but we have to somehow convince the American people to embrace the principles on which this country is founded. Yeah, yeah. Here's Arturo writing, honestly, a bit of fascism wouldn't hurt our country. Yeah, I mean, that's the attitude. That's the attitude Obama and Trump have created. And that's the attitude of people who oppose the left. And that's the attitude that will bring the death of America, end of America, will be that attitude. Just a little bit of fascism, just a little bit of law and order, just a little bit of, of getting the streets cleaned up, just a little bit of the trains running on time. No, I, I think Arturo is not a troll. I think Arturo represents a significant number of Americans today. And I think a growing number of Americans today, a growing number of Trump supporters, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a, a people who 
will thrive and grow and dominate if Trump wins. All right. How come when the synagogue in Pittsburgh was attacked, we didn't see Jews looting and rioting, shouting Jewish lives matter? Well, because Jews don't do that. <laughs> Jews have a deep respect. Uh, even the leftist Jews have respect for private property. At least some of them do. Although, you know, a lot of the, 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 the writers in um, uh, that town in Wisconsin that have a hard time... Uh, pronouncing its name, had Jewish names. So I, I don't know if there was a bunch of Jews came in, leftist Jews, nihilist Jews came in to, to riot for their sake. No, I mean, Jewish oppression. Uh, look, blacks say, I mean, blacks say, we, sub, you know, we had no opportunity to accumulate wealth uh, during slavery. And we had no opportunity to accumulate wealth during um uh, you know, uh, Jim Crow laws. Although that's only partially true. They could have gone north and in the north, black, some blacks did accumulate wealth and so on. But they say this. Certainly during slavery, that's absolutely true. And, and during Jim Crow, the ability to, to earn wealth and save wealth was restricted, right? For example, the ability to own real estate was restricted because of, of redlining. Jews had the same thing, right? Basically, for... Hundreds of years, Jews were not allowed to own property. Jews were excluded from certain professions. Jews couldn't do many, many things. And Jews were dirt poor. And they came to America dirt poor with no capital, nothing. It's as if they had been slaves or the equivalent of because they had nothing. They came to America with nothing. They got off the boats with nothing, no education, nothing. And they survived and thrived and did really, really well. And then in World War II, the Jewish world was basically destroyed. Their homes were destroyed. Their property was stolen. They were completely annihilated. Now, there's some reparations, but the reparations are a fraction of the wealth that was destroyed. And yet, they survived. And, and Jews do give reparations, by the way, from the, from the Germans. German government pays Holocaust survivors reparations. And, and you could argue that if there were um, survivors of slavery today, you could argue about reparations. But you can't argue about reparations 150 years after slavery. That's ridiculous. Um, so, 6% didn't die of COVID. Stop this bullshit, right? I mean, people can't, they can't read statistics again. This is an example of somebody taking something Trump tweeted and viewing it as the truth. 6% died of COVID who didn't have any other comorbidities. But 94% of people died of COVID because their body was already weakened from other diseases. But they didn't have to die. They didn't have to die now. We'll all die someday. But if they were obese, they died of COVID. Because obese people don't die now. They died from COVID. Now. From COVID. No, not with COVID. From COVID. If you look at the number of people who died in America this year and compare it to people who died in America over the same period last year for the last 10 years, you'll see a significant increase in the deaths in America this year. Why? Violent crime is down or was down until the summer. Because of COVID. COVID killed at least 178,000 people, but it probably killed more than that if you look at the actual numbers. I mean, you, you're completely delusional. This way of looking at statistics and numbers is completely delusional. Somebody might have a heart disease, but he could live another 10 years and then he gets COVID and he dies now. So what killed him? The heart disease or COVID? COVID did. Somebody might be obese and can live another 40 years, but he gets COVID and he dies now. Who killed him? COVID. What killed him? COVID. I mean, the dishonesty of using statistics in this way, the dishonesty of using data this way, 
This is how to lie with statistics. On steroids. Yes, Trump deregulated. Trump cut corporate taxes. Trump moved the American embassy to Jerusalem. All good things. Trump's still bad. Wow. I don't know if, that, if you can actually get that. People are amazing. Um, Jews have gotten over their um, victimhood. Jews have dealt with victimhood by excelling. There is a real problem in America with black culture. There's a real problem in America with black intellectuals. There's a real problem in America with black leadership. Black leadership, black intellectuals, and, and leftist intellectuals, or, or not just black, and black culture, have become, cultures, become a culture of victimhood. A culture of victimhood that is embraced by the leadership and embraced by the intellectual. So instead of encouraging blacks to do what the Jews did, instead of encouraging blacks to rise up from where they are, to improve themselves, to succeed, to overcome the racism, and to succeed in spite of it, instead of setting ambitious goals, they set no goals. They accept all failure, and they embrace victimhood. So the enemy of black Americans is black Americans. They're their own enemy, more than the racism of the whites. Now, racism exists, okay, just like anti-Semitism exists. you got to overcome it and fight it at the same time. Ugh, now Tura is showing himself to be the real racist that he is. Disgusting. All right, um, so Jews have a different culture, a culture focused on success, a culture focused on education, a culture focused on learning. Now, I think the problem with Jews is that they're tribal. I don't like the tribe. I don't belong to the tribe. But they have a culture that is much healthier than black culture. And the blacks could learn from the Jews in that sense. Uh, hi, Iran. To live, to be productive, to value, do we need to be able to love? I think if you are able to love beyond romanticism, what you are and do, this is not possible to live fully, is this nihilism thought. So I think you have to be able to love, yes. But to be able to love, you have to be productive. You have to value. Love is a consequence of having self-esteem. Love is a consequence in the sense of loving yourself. Love is a consequence of being a successful human being. So to love, you must be good at living. You must think. You must produce. You must be honest. You must value. You must pursue your values. You must be passionate about your values. Love is what comes out of that activity. You land up loving yourself. You land up loving your life. You land up loving the people around you. You surround yourself with people you love. And you love your values. So you can't separate the two out. Love is a response. It's a response to your values when you value deeply. I think that people who don't produce, don't create, don't live with a capital L, don't use their mind, in the end can't love. And, and part of that leads them to the nihilism. The lack of love leads them to the nihilism. How many Trump supporters are religious and how many are simply compromising? I don't know. I, I have no sense. I think... Uh, I think I, I, I'm surprised by how many have this religious attitude. And it's not surprising given how much support he gets among religious people. That is, it's not surprising given um, his support among evangelicals. Evangelicals are conditioned to accept things on faith. Uh, 
good evening, uh, Mr. Book. What person would you choose as presidential candidate? Loan, no limit on choice. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. I mean, I would choose somebody like um, John Allison, the former CEO of bb and and an objectivist, but a person who can communicate with non-objectivists well, uh, a person who's run a, a successful business, built a, a little farm bank into the, one of the largest financial institutions in the United States, a person who can talk to uh, you know people who uh, have a variety of different ideas, uh, who can motivate people, who can inspire people, who has a way of communicating with the common man and who is considered a philosopher among uh, CEOs? So, a kind of a kind of a person who can who can really take these ideas and build bridges and unite a country around them. Uh, so, I, I think of all the objectivists I know, John would probably be the best candidate for president, and and I think would be terrific. I don't think he could win. I'm all for gun restrictions as long as the government starts with itself. I answered that last time. You, know. you mentioned that maybe voting should be qualified for. Do you think a voting age should be increased? I, I No, I think 18 is reasonable. Um, I think 18 as a voting age is reasonable. I, I think drinking age should be lowered. I don't think there should be a drinking age. Um, but I think if you can go to the military, then you should be able to vote if you can... Yeah, I think 18 is a reasonable time to, to allow for voting as, a reason, as an age. But, uh, you know, it's not hard and set. There's some people who never achieve the maturity to allow them to vote, and there's some people who do it at 15. But I, I think you have to set some age, and then maybe people can apply for emancipation, and that would include voting, let's say. Um, all right, last question, and I'll leave the rest of the question for next time, so slowly catching up. Do government programs designed to fight racism increase racial resentment? Absolutely. I think absolutely. I think affirmative action uh, uh, has increased racial resentment uh, in particular. I think the idea that, um, I, I don't know, certain people get into Harvard, they don't have the grades or the aptitude to get into Harvard, but, and some people who have the grades and the aptitude to get into Harvard don't because of color of skin, because of racial quotas, I think is disgusting. It's racist. And I think it creates resentment. I think the fact that we te treat certain people of certain color skins with kid gloves, we treat them delicately in all kinds of ways, um, I, I, think, I think encourages uh, people, uh, whites, to, to, to rile up against it. To rile up against it. I mean, so I definitely think the more, the more you deal with racism, Sorry, the more you deal with race, the more racist a, a culture becomes. The more race is an issue in the law and in the functioning of a society, the more racist the society will become. All right. Let me sign off here this uh, last time for uh, August. Uh, again, Derek, thank you for everything you've done the last few months in supporting me and helping with the marketing and the results have been amazing uh you know really really stunning um thank you all for the support don't forget to like the show before you leave but most importantly don't forget to support the show before you leave you can support the show with a quick super chat before we leave um you don't even have to ask a question you just can contribute some money uh you can also support the show through your on book show dot uh, com slash support you can do your on book show uh, sorry, you're on Brook on Patreon and on Subscribestar and on Locals. So uh, hopefully you can get in uh, you can get in some support before the day is out uh, and uh, and help us to uh, to keep this going. I have to say August, in terms of your support, has been by far the biggest month ever, ever. So uh, thank you for that. It's been uh, a fantastic month. Let's keep it going into September. We'll keep it going into September. All right, everybody. Uh, I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you, uh, Jax. And I will see you on, um, on Wednesday, uh, same time, same place, new topic. We'll be talking about the same stuff. Hopefully some new stuff. Bye, everybody.